Star Trek Nemesis is a troubled movie with a lot of weird, kind of inexplicable stuff going on, but we actually get an interesting shot in the first moments of the film, where we get the camera sweeping past Remus to reveal Romulus, the Romulan homeworld. Now, this shot is admittedly pretty cool, and if we understand everything on screen to be literal canon, then it actually gives us some pretty concrete information on the nature of Romulus and Remus, and a basis for understanding how this double planet works. To really start understanding this shot, I need to figure out the sizing and the spacing of Romulus and Remus, as well as the apparent sun in the shot. So I did some 3D camera tracking on this shot and figured out this spacing. The two planets were similar in size and about five diameters apart. And while these planets might seem pretty far apart, it's nothing compared to anything resembling normal or natural. If we assume that Romulus has a diameter similar to Earth, then Romulus and Remus are about 65,000 kilometers or 40,000 miles apart. For comparison, the Earth and our moon are on average 380,000 kilometers apart. That's 236,000 miles. So that means that Romulus and Remus are tremendously close together and reflect an extremely rare, or more accurately, a purely hypothetical scenario, one that has never been observed in real life. And that is two similarly sized planets with a sustainable orbit around each other. In most scenarios, we would expect these planets to just slam into each other, or alternatively, the friction between the two planets tugging on each other with their gravity would cause the planets to heat up to insane temperatures in a process known as tidal heating. But theoretically, this sort of dual inhabitable planet scenario is possible so long as the planets remain tidally locked, which means that the same side of each planet faces the other at all times, or more academically, the period of the revolution and the rotation are the same. In this scenario, the force that each planet exerts on the other falls into a more manageable range, and thus the effects of tidal heating are minimized. This also minimizes ocean tides. We all know that our moon basically pulls our oceans upward by a few feet, but now imagine how much more severe those differences would be with an Earth-sized object doing the pooling. Of course, in this scenario, there wouldn't be water for very long at all, because the tidal heating would probably heat up the planet so much that the oceans evaporated. But when the planets are tidally locked, this keeps both the ocean tides and heating effects to a minimum, and could theoretically sustain an M-class climate, and any heating that the two planets cause for each other could be mitigated by the planets being slightly further from their sun. For a real-world instance, the absolute closest example we have to a double planet is Pluto and its moon Charon. And while neither of these bodies is technically a planet, and the size discrepancy is fairly large, at least compared to Romulus and Remus, the two orbit each other in the way I've just described. They are tidally locked with one another. But there's a problem with all this, because I've ignored a key fact that, canonically, Remus is not tidally locked with Romulus, but with its star, which means that one side of the planet is perpetually dark. Though, of course, this wouldn't really be true, because for any period where Romulus appeared in the night sky above Remus, which would theoretically be pretty often, it would appear incredibly bright, probably significantly brighter than it looks in the movie. And even ignoring the fact that this probably isn't even possible because Romulus would easily dislodge the tidal locking, now we get every sort of tidal problem between Romulus and Remus. Romulus would have catastrophic ocean tides, and both planets would become uninhabitable lava worlds before long. This little point that Remus has a perpetual night side literally dooms both worlds. So the problem isn't that we're looking at one scenario being possible while another isn't, though the canonical situation is unsustainable at best and might not work at all. But instead, the situation is that in order for both worlds to be habitable for any appreciable length of time, the canonical situation simply doesn't work. Remus can't have a perpetual night side. Well, unless Romulus did as well, which doesn't seem to be the case. So is there some extreme scenario where this actually works? Or do we have to disregard canon here? Or does physics come in second place? Let me know what you think. If you like this sort of thing, make sure to subscribe and check out some of my other videos, like an analysis I did on the ringed planet in the Voyager opening. To all of you, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.